you bet. Okay. We don't need any more of these. All right, y'all. It's the intro video. So nice. We have to uh, double up the sound so you can hear it twice, apparently. <laughs> Let me know if you can hear and see us. I figured out what the problem is. There was a scroll bar and something was hidden off the bottom of the scroll bar. So uh, we should be good to go now. <laughs> Give me a 5x5 five five in chat over there. I'm looking over here reading some chat. Let me know if we are good to go so we can start another exciting episode of Today's NSF Live. It's our weekly show we do every Sunday now. We've recently moved that to Sundays. And we we are ready to talk to a special guest. I've already put him on the screen over here. It is Mr. Matthew Coons from Maston Space Systems. Matthew, how are you doing? Thank you so much for joining us today. Um, great. Thank you so much for having us on this show. It's really excited to be here. Excellent. And uh, on the other side of Matthew here, we've got Mr. Jack Byer. Jack, what are you up to? Oh, nothing. Just excited to talk shop about one of my very favorite space companies. I love Maston. They do so much. And uh, I don't know. I'm hyped. I've had some coffee. I'm ready to go. Let's do this. Uh-oh. Jack's had coffee, y'all. <laughs> Matthew, you ready for that? Have you ever seen Jack with coffee before? <laughs> uh, probably. Possibly. We've been crossing paths off and on for a couple of years, so it's nice to be kind of in this format instead of you know, at a launch pad setting up remote cameras. Good deal. So what do you what do you do for Mastin? I mean, first off, let's ask what you do, and then what? I mean, who's Mastin? What does Mastin do? <laughs> well, Mastin is uh, David Mastin was the founder and kind of started the company back in 2004 with a uh, very great group of folks who have now kind of gone out into the industry and started a bunch of other companies as well. Um, and so, over, you know, over the past 17 plus years since 2004, we've been slowly building up, focusing on executing, flying, testing and creating value for our customers through simulating EDL type trajectories here on earth with our terrestrial vehicles. And now we're going to the moon. Gotcha. Okay. I got it. Which is pretty wild. I'll jump in real quick. EDL vehicles. When you say EDL vehicles, what do you, what's EDL? Sure. EDL is entry, descent and landing. So it's the last little bit before you actually touch down on a planetary surface. And that's one of the, the toughest things to master. So that's kind of, where our vehicles specialize. Gotcha. And I think that's why your uh, your homepage shows this little thing um, hopping up and down. Mm -hmm. again. I say this little thing like, oh, yeah, it's this little thing hopping up and down again. Um, but what I mean, you're not launching things all the way into space. You're testing things on the ground. Like what? How, how does that work? I mean, people would say, wow, we've never heard of Mastin before. What is Mastin doing? Why haven't we heard? I bet you a lot of people don't know what's going on. Um, why haven't we heard about Mastin? Yeah, that's, I mean, we've historically been on the smaller side of new space. We are primarily running off revenue. And up until the lunar mission, you know, we had somewhere between, you know, 15 and, and 20 people. And kind of the, the ability to take everything that we have been working on in Mojave with these little landers and start and actually translate it to the moon. Um, such a huge opportunity, and it's really let us grow and you know increase in size. We we really prefer to talk about the things we've done instead of the things we've we want to do. Yep. So that's also been driving some of the sort of less what, attention. Yeah, what people have heard about y'all are y'all are out there um, testing a lot of stuff. I guess would be the right way to say it. Like you've got all these different subsystems. You've got things that test the landing. You've got things that test uh, launch, like landing pads. We'll talk about that in a little bit. Like, what do you do? Do you need a landing pad on the moon or not? It's it's subsystems, like you said. It's all the little pieces that come together to actually enable ending up on the moon. And so you're testing all those uh, out in Mojave. And I think today we're going to get through a lot of the different things that y'all have been working on, right? Yeah, definitely. We've got a lot to talk about. We're doing a lot. We On a good week, we've been out testing five different you know, vehicles or, or, or engines over five different days when we're really busy so we get a lot of time out in the in the test range gotcha and i think y'all mentioned earlier jack um you've actually met up with matt before somewhere out in the field right were you sneaking yes. did you sneak through a fence or something and get on the range or never what? never i would never jeopardize range security you know that uh but no uh Matt, you're a rocket launch photographer like a lot of us are, right? And uh, we've seen each other at various launches. And 
I believe it was like a there was like an event in 2019. It was like a moon to Mars themed event at at Armstrong. And then they packed all the media up uh, and shuttled us over from Armstrong to Mojave to tour Maston. And I walk into the the warehouse you guys had there with I think it was Zodiac was set up. Uh, one of Zodiac your, and Zombie. Yeah, you're one of two of your uh, your landers there, and I walk in and you're standing right there and start giving the speech, and I was like, "What? Wait, what? I had no idea you worked for for Maston." So it's cool how you know it's kind of like a small community, but uh, I'm just I'm super excited to to talk shop with you and and figure out how we can best explain to everybody how cool Maston is because whenever I'm talking about Mojave, there's a couple things I love to hit on, and one is the fact that Maston, you guys exist out there, and you do really, really cool stuff. And like you said, you've been doing it for what 17 years now. Uh, I mean, I don't know if it's if it's apocryphal or not. It might be, but I've I've heard tell that uh, back in the days when a certain other company was looking into uh, figuring out how to recover their boosters, they saw what y'all were doing out there in Mojave with vertical takeoff and vertical landing and kind of went all in on the vertical takeoff, vertical landing thing instead of, you know, parachutes or what have you. I mean, the experience you guys have built up over, over this amount of time is truly staggering. Yeah. We've, we've done over 600 rocket powered takeoffs and landings and there, there are definitely some stories out there and emails and we're glad to have been inspirational to some of the other companies that are doing it, showing that it can be done. And then that can be built off of and scaled. So one of the coolest things Dave did back in the day was kind of the first in-air relight of a, of a rocket and then landing it. So it's a pretty crazy, crazy video, but you see zombie go up engine shuts off. Yep reaches apogee and then they they restart it and land it all autonomously oh i think we've got the video I think right it's that Look one right that. yeah 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 so that was the first time that had ever been done so so when was this from that was quite a while ago don't take the date you can check the youtube video for the date but probably yeah. around 2011 2012 no kidding so you just had this, you had a lander. I mean, I say a lander. I mean, it's taking off and the landing again and it goes up and then it comes down and it hovers and you were actually able to successfully do that. Did y'all just wake up one morning and say, we're going to make these test vehicles go up and go down and land? Or were you part of a, a NASA thing or how did y'all decide to work on this? Yeah, this was all part of Dave's vision. He really has a strong vision to make space access more attainable and reusable. We don't like throwing vehicles away. We want to fly our vehicles 100 plus times and we want to take what we're doing here on Earth and transition that to the moon as well. So reusable lunar landers, space tugs, um, sample return, all, all, all of it. So this is really a step on that path towards kind of sustainable and reusable cis lunar operations. Yeah, that makes sense. You you can't just uh, be throwing away your lunar lander. You gotta you want to you're going to want to use it over and over and over and over and over. They're kind of expensive, so yes. <laughs> expensive to build, expensive to launch into position and everything. So, yes. so you said six hundred land is was it six hundred landings? That's a that's a lot of landings. Yes, it is. And that is across how many vehicles? Uh, that's across five different vehicles. Okay. And over about 12 years. So I see, I'm probably going to butcher these these names, but there's Xylene, Zeline. Run, run through the different vehicles for me, if you can, if you don't mind. Sure. The, the first two way back in the day was um, Zoe and Zogdor. Those were the kind of the first two vertical takeoff, vertical landing for the uh, NASA Centennial Lunar Lander Challenge. And then kind of that has turned into a thing where all of our vehicles are named after X's. There, there's an X on, as the first letter. So Zeline is our lunar lander that we're, we're building in Mojave right now, and that's launching next year. And then um, after Zoe and Zombie, we've, we had um, Zodiac as our, as our current flying vehicle. Zeus, which you, which you see up there, is, was our partnership with ULA to design a reusable kind of lunar cargo resupply vehicle. And then um, we've got zero A and zero B as well, which had uh, aero shells for kind of higher performance flight. 
and that was the little zero a was the little one you had in the in the opening video a few minutes ago got it yeah the ones that look like kind of like a little white bullet got yes it. very cool and so you said those are for like a, like a higher performance type situation like did they go to a higher altitude than other of your vehicles or where what was the what was the thinking there that's exactly at higher higher altitudes higher velocities um, and that's that's really what we're doing with our next vehicle Zogdor as well uh, be able to get higher performance in that EDL kind of final approach so we can hit uh, 200 meters per second for example on, a, on approach and kind of mimic some of those extraterrestrial landings more closely because the, the closer you can simulate it the better odds you have of pulling it off when you actually get to Mars or you know any of these other other planets. And that was a big thing for uh, Mars 2020 and Mastin on Zombie back in 2015 did a bunch of of tests looking at some of that terrain relative navigation TRN technology and optimized diverts uh, to make sure that you could read the terrain and then on the fly calculate a, a new landing trajectory and, and go stick your landing within a you know a couple of meters and so they use that on mars 2020 to great success i don't know if you've seen the the landing map of the hazards that they had to navigate around but it's yeah. it's pretty wild they were able to pull off that landing and Mastin was grateful to be a big part of proving out that technology because they were able to buy down the risk here on earth so they could fly it on Mars and save themselves like a two year drive. That's real nice. Yeah. So I, Matt, I've got like a whole list of stuff here <laughs> and we've sort of given an overview of different things, but do you want to dive a little bit deeper into some of the specific things that we've been talking about? Like literally I have more things that I could possibly show in an hour and a half, but if you want, we can start talking specifically about uh, some of the things. Do you just want to pick one and start talking or how do you want to do it? Or do you want your readers or your listeners to, uh, to pick one? We can go either way. Oh, okay. Got, so, I love all the projects, so yeah, I, can talk about I, all of them. I don't know that we should entrust the uh, viewers with that level of responsibility on the stream <laughs> here. <laughs> we may not get a good result from that. Um, why don't we just start with? Uh, I, I don't know, like the list that I've got. Are they in any specific order? But it goes, Zeline, Zeline. Zeline is the lunar lander. Okay, so that's a good place to start. Yeah, do you want to have a there? question? We do have a question saying, "What is the purpose of Z Zeline?" Well, uh, there we go. So perfect. All right. Are you, are you saying what is, what is? What do you mean? What is the purpose to go to go to the south pole of the moon? Um, well, like like what is uh, Zeline uh, designed to do, and and how will it accomplish that? Yeah, definitely. here's the mission so, right here. It's on their website. There it is. <laughs> you, can, uh, you can reserve payload space if you uh, if you want. Is there like so a form Zeline... I can fill out? Go ahead, Matt. <laughs> Tell us about Zeline. <laughs> uh, Zeline started years and years ago, like 2014 was when it originally started coming together under a, a program called NASA Catalyst. And so we've been been working on it ever since then. And it's gone through a number of different iterations and it's designed to affordably take a 100 to 500 kilograms of payload to the lunar surface. Uh, the first mission is going to the lunar South Pole. And then there's also equatorial versions with different solar panel placement. So it's really designed for that kind of space infrastructure and transportation to enable the science and enable those pathfinding missions to you know, hopefully precursors to Artemis and get hardware on the surface as quickly and affordably as possible under the Eclipse program now, which is NASA Commercial Lunar Payload Services. And right. So you guys are basically making the bus that takes all of the payloads. Uh, for I mean not to not to oversimplify, but but that uh, that's basically what's going on there. And you kind of do that now, right? With with all of your test vehicles on Earth, like you have right, you have flown payloads for other companies to you know help them research various aspects, whether it's that navigational um, oh, the, the navigational aid you were talking about. I'm going to butcher the acronym if I try and remember it, but that's it's super cool that you guys are able to you know enable all of this technology development that is necessary to open up the moon for, you know, exploration and dare I say resource exploitation. H help me out here. I brought up this animation. 
and mm-hmm. it's the little Zeline lander, and it's just da, 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 on its way to the moon. Is this literally how it goes? There's not like another big carrier thing, then a stage, then this and that and the other. Um, this just gets kicked out of Earth orbit on a translunar trajectory, and then coasts on out there, just like the animation shows. Uh, yeah, it's it's a self-sustaining. Once we separate from the launch vehicle, yeah, it'll put us into a, a trajectory leaving Leo, and then we take over and do the rest of the the mission several day uh, coast and trajectory correction maneuvers on the way to the moon. And once we get into lunar orbit, we line it up and stick the landing. Nice. I like the confidence there. Um, (laughs) So this one, I'm going to hop back real quick. This one that we see in the animation has its uh, its solar panels on the side. And you said there were two different solar panel orientations. I'm going to assume that one with solar panels on the side is either designed to land on a very steep slope, I'm kidding, um, or near the the, <laughs> the north or south pole of the moon where you get sort of the sun coming in at a higher angle instead of on the equator of the moon where the sun's coming straight down. Did I guess correctly? That's that's exactly correct. It's very much like exactly like the Arctic versus the, the equator here on Earth. The the sun gets pretty low along the horizon in the in the polar regions of the moon. So and you have very long um, short lunar days, long lunar nights during during the lunar you know winter so gotcha. very analogous all right so this is like what we're seeing in the animation it's literally something that put somebody could put payloads on and then you put it on top of a rocket it gets kicked out towards the moon it handles delivery from basically earth orbit out to the moon all the way down to the surface and then the payloads can be tested on the surface of the moon that's the purpose right. of zeline Yes. I keep wondering yep. if I'm pronouncing it correctly. That's why I'm like hesitating. Yeah. Zeline. It's not Xylene or Zilinor or something like that. <laughs> <laughs> there's a lot I'm of X's s- in these names. Go ahead, Jack. I'm slightly concerned. At what point do you run out of X names? I feel like there's. It's like the. It's got to be the the shortest amount of of namespace that you can go for is X names. <laughs> I'm, I'm not gonna lie. It took us a while to name this one. I'm gonna have to uh, really start digging deep for the next round of vehicles. <laughs> It's like it's like five years from now. You just name one uh, Xerox. I don't know. Xerox. <laughs> I think that one's taken already. Actually, um, so here's the other animation of Zeline, and it looks like it's doing a, a landing burn. I can see the engines going there, um, flying close over the surface. But this is sort of this is the EDL part of. Well, I guess the this is actually all of the EDL that you were talking about earlier when you said EDL because you've entered the. I guess it's not the atmosphere, but you've entered the moon's influence whatever, area of operations, whatever you want to say, and uh, you descended down, the animation is still happening, and then I'm going to time it just right, and then you land on the moon. That's where you get the EDL from, right? Exactly. Gotcha. Um, What, how big is this? Like, I'm looking at it on the screen, there are moon rocks, I haven't seen a lot of moon rocks in person, um, except for that one that has everybody's fingerprints on it at the visitor center, at Kennedy Space Center, but <laughs> how big is it? Is this like the size of a truck, the size of a golf cart, the size of a tank? Yeah, it's it's pretty pretty big. Um, I don't know if we put any pictures of kind of the scale scale model. I think there's a scale model on one of our Twitter Twitter pictures, but it's it's pretty big. Okay. Yeah. Like pretty six big, like how how big in diameter? Over six feet in diameter. Six feet in diameter. Gotcha. So about as wide as a vehicle. Maybe it would fit in the bed of a truck, or come really close to fitting in the bed of a truck. Yeah, not not quite. It's it's a, it's more than six feet in diameter. Okay. So it's, right. it's pretty big. Gotcha. So where so are you? Hear any of the rocket equation? Yeah. To, uh, to take that much payload to the moon, you need to bring a lot of propellant yep where are you at in the development of this is there like one sitting in a garage somewhere is this just we've made these cool renderings and 3d animations um we've just drawn it like where is the development for this lander yeah so uh, the team is really heads down working hard um we're past cdr and components are on order things are being assembled we're Building clean rooms, mock-ups, running tests. The the team is kind of working all out. So, gotcha. We're, we're in the middle of it. We're in the middle of it. Okay. In in you know we always hear we always we we'll watch a bleh, we always watch a lot of rocket launches on the channel here. I'm going to assume that 
this is sort of agnostic. It could go to space on a lot of different launch vehicles. It's not locked. We designed this thing to specifically fit in this one fairing for this one rock at the end. Is that a correct assessment? That is a correct assessment. Uh, we're providing a transportation service, and what makes the most sense for a launch at a given time or for a given mission is we want to have flexibility there. Gotcha. Um, I don't want to ask too many detailed questions, but if you can't answer them, just look quietly at the camera, and then I'll go to the next question. Um, is this the sort of thing where you could maybe put multiples of these on a rocket from a mass perspective, from a volume perspective? Typical rockets that we may have heard of these days, could they carry multiples on a trajectory to the moon? I think it really depends on which rocket you're talking about. Okay. <laughs> Um, is that There's some big of... ones coming up, right? Yeah, there are some. <laughs> well, oh, come on. <laughs> there are definitely some big ones coming up. Um, is that sort of a design point? Like, oh, we're going to put stack three of these. Because it, it really does look like you could just stack three on top of each other and send them. But I don't know the masses and all that sort of thing. Is that sort of a design? Oh, nice. That's exactly how you should handle that question. Thank you. Uh, <laughs> sip from the mug. Excellent. <laughs> Um, anything else interesting or, or curious that we would want to learn about Zeline, the lunar lander that you're working on, sort of the delivery system from Earth to the surface of the moon? I'm really curious to know, like, payload stuff, uh, like what is planned to be flown on it. I mean, if, you know, I think there are, there's a list of, of stuff already, and I think you said there's some reserve payload as well, so. Yeah, yeah, there's, there's a list of nine instruments from the NASA Eclipse program. Uh, I could read them all off or we can put a link in there for for your viewers if you if you'd like yeah. but some really exciting payloads doing all sorts of really interesting lunar science a lot of the kind of entry plume surface interaction studies being looked at a little rover from astrobotic and you know that's a good example of the cooperation as we as we work to build a, a lunar ecosystem right astrobotic is one of our I guess on paper they're a competitor because they're launching clips missions of their own right um in the past they've flown payloads on our terrestrial vehicles on on zombie and now we're bringing one of their lunar rovers to the moon so i think it's it's a good example of working together collectively to make something happen that we all want to happen so we shouldn't trip over our, each other on the way Gotcha. And I'm going to look through chat really quickly here and see if there were any Zeline related questions. And then we'll hop on. Because like I said, I've got like a five page document over here that have all the different projects that you're working on. So I don't want to talk about one for 45 minutes and then have no time for the rest. Um, let me see chat. If you have something specific to this vehicle, um, ask it and we'll see if we can't get something here. Um, oh, well, you're, while you're looking, I'll just plug the uh, if people want to work on Zeline. We do have job openings. Oh, that was actually that was a that question. Was a question. I saw pop up. Yeah, yep. someone was asking if you guys are hiring, so that's we good are. to know. See, so we just is the best thing to go to the website there. It's Mastin Space Systems uh, dot com or what is it? Mastin dot. I just looked. Mastin at dot aero. A Mastin dot aero. There you go. Okay, I just looked at the wrong address here. Um, nice top it, level domain. That's a good one. Yeah, exactly. We've got uh, Mojave positions, and we also have quite a few re remote positions. We've embraced the the new world. COVID order. Yeah. Gotcha. Uh, here's one. Uh, what is the smallest rocket that can launch something like Zeline? Eh. Like, can that, can get, can that get uh, put into orbit or put on its way to the moon, I suppose, uh, on something like an Electron? Or does it need, uh, you know, a, a larger launch vehicle? It does need a, a larger launch vehicle. Yeah. yeah. Athens, Falcon, Starship, New Glenn. Any of them can do it. Gotcha. Um, this was a good question, Jack. I don't know if we saw this one. Alan Curtis asked, is this designed to be a one-way vehicle or return vehicle? This one is one-way. We're hoping in not too many years we can figure out that lunar reusability. There's there's quite a few uh, sequential technology development steps that you have to, have to go through on your way to getting lunar reuse. But yep. It's on the roadmap. It's something we're actively working towards, and you know, it's one of the it's one of the things we really want to push and 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 develop. Um, and it's all the little technical achievements that that we work on. You know, 
on the Mojave test flights, which will eventually pave the way we did for uh, honeybee robotics. We did a test of something called Planet Vac, which was a which was a sampling technology built into the the leg of, of Zodiac. So we we took off, transitioned over into a, a simulant bin, landed in that simulant, took a sample, and then without human interaction with the vehicle took back off and, and returned to our original launch site. And I think that's the first time a rocket has done multiple hops without any sort of human interaction with the vehicle before. So little things like that is yep. how we're going to learn what we need to learn so we can do it on the moon. Like literally just a core sampler on a leg or something like that, where it, it presses down into there and then closes up. Then when you take off, you've got some sample with you. I mean, even something sure. like that seems, it's like, oh, that's obvious. The landing legs have to touch down. Why not just use them to collect samples? But I've never heard of that before. So, Yeah, I remember I think the the honeybee or a representative from them gave uh, a talk about that, that very thing at that 2019 event, uh, that Moon to Mars event that they had at Armstrong. And the fact that, I've gone from hearing about it in a presentation to you guys have already flown it and tested it is, is just, it's really cool. It iterative approach and, and, a, and a rapid one. But like you said, there's just so many little pieces that have to be sort of checked off. I would, Oh man, I'm like thinking in video game terms, like thinking about that tech tree. It's like, there's so many branches, which way do the I go? Tech tree. Mastin is literally <laughs> unlocking the tech tree for everybody else. Like you're doing all the testing up front. Like, does this work? Does this work? Um, I've left this image it's on the not screen. Not dissimilar to Kerbal Space Program. There you go. Nice. How many science <laughs> points to unlock a landing leg scoop? Like, <laughs> I love it. Um, I left this image on the screen specifically because there were two relevant questions. Uh, what engine will be used on Zeline? Something y'all are making. Yeah, we're using a traditional Hypergall engine. And I'm not sure if we've, I think we've announced who we're partnering with on that. But uh, Frontier Aerospace. Very gotcha. cool. Yeah. And then uh, you just you just answered both of the questions. One question was what engine will be used. The other one was what kind of propellant. So um, you're getting an engine from another provider, and it's a Hypergall engine, to sum that up. Correct. Right? That's a traditional Hypergall. Gotcha. Is there like a non-traditional Hypergall that... I don't know, has tattoos or something? I don't know what a non-traditional <laughs> hypergall would be. <laughs> so under the Lunar Catalyst program, Mastin started developing a green hypergall called ah. MXP351, which will, you know, it's much safer to handle. So some of these traditional hypergallic rocket propellants, the reason they are so effective as rocket propellants is because they are very bad for people. Right. So uh, we like working with things that are a little safer on our test site, and we've we've been in development of that technology for a number of years. But given given where it was and the pandemic and everything associated with that, it made more sense to go with a traditional solution, lower risk. Yeah. On the first mission. Gotcha. Sort of lean on the old technology that's been proven while you continue to work on the newer technology, the traditional versus the safer hypergall. I don't know if that's the right terminology, but that's what I'm going to go with. Step by step. Step by step. Nice. Um, let's move on and talk a little bit about Zodiac. I'm literally just going to start going down the list. Zodiac was the VTVL vehicle. And when we say VTVL, we mean what? Vertical takeoff, vertical landing. All right. So well, this type of takeoff and landing, the, I might add. Agreed. <laughs> Jack, don't you, don't you photograph planes all the time? Hey, if if uh, if a Harrier goes by, I'm not gonna shake my nose at it. <laughs> <laughs> shake your nose at or it, or thumb my nose, or whatever the expression is. <laughs> um. All right. So I have like fifteen thousand pictures of Zodiac here. So y'all start talking, and I will find pictures to put on the screen. <laughs> well, Zodiac has very much been our workhorse vehicle since 2016. So um, she's done over a hundred flights and taken quite a few uh, payloads for customers. We do a lot of flight flying through the NASA Flight Opportunities Program, which is an absolutely spectacular uh, program through NASA where uh, customers can get funding to take their technology and fly it on our vehicle or other companies' vehicles, depending on what they need to do. And so we, we specialize in this terrain relative navigation, entry, descent, and landing type payload testing. And this is really where we, where we excel and what sets us apart. So... This is actually a picture of a vision system for the moon um, flying on, on the Zodiac vehicle. 
Gotcha. I mean, so so the vehicle is Zodiac, and then you're testing different things on it. Like you said, a, a vision system on this one. I mean, Zodiac is literally some fuel tanks, a rocket engine, <laughs> a frame. <laughs> and some legs. Some yeah. legs, and then spot to bolt payloads too, right? Yeah, it, it was an intentionally open architecture to make it easy to mount payloads all over the vehicle wherever they, they need to be. You know, done it down there on the landing legs, and then this one is that little white circle up there on the top. Up on the like up on up yep. here somewhere. I don't know if it's that one or there's another circle over there. Or... Yep, it's that one. So. Okay, cool. And then I circled both, yep. and people are like, "Which one? The right or left?" <laughs> it's <laughs> the was, right one. To the right. Okay, the one's sticking off more. Okay, sorry. Oh, the, the open architecture makes sense though, because if you're bolting different things on, you don't want to have to go, you know, digging way into the superstructure of a of a vehicle in order to to get at an instrument or install it or whatever. I'm constantly reminded of. My Land Rover, where if you want to fix thing A, you first have to take out thing C, thing D, thing E, and thing Q. And then you can fix thing A. <laughs> yeah. Uh, but that's that makes a lot of sense. Um, and scale-wise, it's about, what, I think it's like 8 or, or 10 feet tall, somewhere around there? Yeah, 10, 10 to 12 feet tall. It's, it's pretty tall. Very cool. I, I have a picture I'm bringing up for that, because um, it's got the oh, people perfect. walking around it. So let's see. That should give you a sense of scale for for the test vehicle. Yeah, and not to I mean to continue the Kerbal analogy. This looks like something I would I mean not me maybe you Doss would build in Kerbal because I'm not good at Kerbal but I know you are. <laughs> but for real, like if you need to gather a bunch of data and you want to get a whole bunch of science points, for lack of a better term, you build a vehicle like this and you fly it over and over again and you gather information from different regimes of flight with different instruments yep. and. That's how you advance down the tech tree. I mean, I, I'm just going to beat this analogy to death. I'm sorry, but it it really like this perfectly illustrates uh, what it is that y'all do there, at Mastin. Yeah, yeah. This is a really, you know, a, a decade of learning went into this vehicle to design it for operability and and this type of this type of work for our customers. This vehicle has flown up to five times in a single day and it, it can fly multiple times per week. So incredibly fast turnarounds, incredibly easy to work with, a very robust, very robust vehicle. That definitely seems like a rapidly reusable test bed if you've flown it five times in a day. Yeah. <laughs> you know? I'm just kicking myself that I wasn't there that day. Ah, <laughs> it was right there in Mojave. It was every I assume it was every in time. Every time I'm in Mojave, I'm like, huh, is there going to be anything? Nothing. I still <laughs> to this day haven't seen a, a Mastin test flight. But if you're doing five in one day, sometimes I mean, hey, maybe I have a good chance in the future. Well, we'll get you out here eventually. I would love it. Here's a question um, regarding. Uh, refurbishment how much refurbishment does it need between launches i mean if you're flying it five times in a day i imagine the answer is not much uh, ideally it's it's nothing it's nothing depending on the length of the flight you might have to refuel it or top off the helium uh, but you do visual inspections and and data inspections and roll into the next operation that's the amazing team is, the team is very streamlined at that very cool uh and what kind of fuel is used in uh in zodiac yeah, Zodiac uses, you know, old school rocket propellants, uh, liquid oxygen and isopropyl alcohol, IPA. So it's really easy to work with, uh, lower ISP compared to something like kerosene or, or LOX methane, but incredibly easy to work with, very forgiving, especially on the uh, on the fuel side. So Makes sense. Uh, does that fuel mixture sort of help enable the rapidness of of reuse of you know flying it again and again yeah it does it it does it burns pretty cleanly and that's one of the reasons we we don't kind of play in the locks caro or, or some of the other more propellants that that'll leave coking and, and residues on propulsion surfaces so we like we like cleaner cleaner burning fuels and that's why we uh are the old vehicles are locks ipa and the new vehicles are uh, Lox methane. That's what Zogdor is. So, this is a picture of Planet Back, by the way. That initial hop test, and you can see us all uh, clustered behind the blocks in the background. <laughs> <laughs> I love it. Is there is there a Planet Vac on each foot? Is that how that works, or is it on one foot only? Uh, there was a Planet Vac on each foot for um, CG center of gravity and, and mass stability, uh, but only one of them was was functional for the testing. Ah, okay, that makes sense. In the, in the pit there. Very, very cool. 
And this was the one where you said uh, you put sample collection things on the le- the legs, right? Right. Planet Vac was it, all right. Did it actually vacuum the surface of the planet? It did. It's a, it's a really cool design. Uh, I think there's a there's a great video that Honeybee and Planetary Society also helped with this this test campaign. It was actually crowdfunded, which was pretty awesome. It's a crowdfunding rocket science and there's there's a good vehicle or a good uh, video that kind of walks through all the some of the cool features of this and this this technology it's it's now bound for the moon on one of the next clips missions yeah and it's actually bound for uh, phobos as well to no do kidding. some sample collecting there so I... it's going to make a make the rounds of the solar system i got i got to point this out real quick and i'm going to make the image not perfect for a second but uh, let me move it up there we go so help me understand right there is a little thing on the landing pad, like a little barrier or something, and then there's some bricks, and then there's what seems to be like regolith simulant, right? Or yes. something like that in this area here. But this is where this thing landed. It had to take off from somewhere, and did it come over here, and you had to put that leg in that tiny target? Not just land on the pad, but you had to put the leg in the target for the simulant that's just that little spot. Correct. Yeah, I think the the darker... The darker uh, burn scar just beyond that far landing gear. I believe that's where it took off on this flight, and then it transitioned over and, and landed. We can pretty reliably hit, you know, plus or minus two centimeters. Two centimeters? That's wow. <laughs> two centimeters. <laughs> <laughs> so, so this this burn scar, the scar back here, right? The the charred area is it took off from, and then it flew over, and then it put itself down did it go like okay one inch off the ground and then hover over did it go 10 feet off the ground like i'm curious uh it goes about up about a meter up about a meter this this test gotcha yeah and not i mean it's hovering on the rocket engine the entire time the single engine it's balancing on the little pillar of fire to move itself over and then put the leg down in the regulant bin brick yard i'm not even sure (laughs) the little regular regolith area right yeah, there's some pretty great videos on our YouTube channel where you can see from the from the engine camera perspective. It's an engineering camera, but yeah, yeah, uh, some of them, like the 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 zombie Mars EDL divert one in particular, has some some good footage of the rocket or the uh, the rocket engine gimbaling, and you can see it changing thrust. And it's all about keeping control of something that doesn't necessarily want to be in control yeah that should not be hovering on a pillar of fire like yes. <laughs> yeah that's yeah. it's it's such a cool technical achievement and uh, and you guys have been doing it for so long now uh, it's it really just i mean that's part of the reason anytime i can not shut up about maston i will not shut up about mastons because it's really really cool the stuff that you guys are doing i know i've already said that once but i cannot underscore it enough um you know just out there every day in Mojave flying these things and, and gathering important data. And huge props to our, our GNC guidance navigation control team for, for making that happen. Um, you can't fly control and land a rocket like this without the huge depth and breadth of knowledge that, that they bring to, to the company. They've, they've gotten the rocket able to hover so precisely. You can look at a video and think it's a still image and we, we did one flight opportunity program um, a couple of years ago on, on on one of our vehicles. It was it was flown at night with a star shield, so they were trying to take an offset telescope, you know, 300 feet away, occlude a star disk with our vehicle, and then look for exoplanets. So it was able to to hover that that stable. Wow! So that it could occlude a star with the vehicle, like literally just put the vehicle in the way and that's how accurately you could hover it yeah there was a little uh shield off off, off the one side, side. Just, ah just uh yeah no kidding that's wild i, I love uh it. so yeah huge props to our gnc team yeah no kidding that's where the magic happens um let's see here i did there's there's Fifteen thousand things about this vehicle but i want to see if there's a couple other I've got a video here from an exocam test. Can we talk about that for a little bit? Because it has camera in it, so it got my attention. Yeah, that was a really, really cool test series from this fall. Let's see. It's going to take me just That's a like second. That's 
the little ball that you guys eject that has okay yeah i love this thing yeah yeah they you know eventually it's going to go to the moon and hopefully other planets but it's it's designed to eject from the vehicle before landing on final descent so you can actually get that external view of your rocket landing on your surface and so you'll be able to learn a lot about plume surface dynamics yeah. plume surface interactions that's a huge huge piece of research that needs to get worked on as we go back to the moon particularly with larger vehicles and that's been something Maston has been spending a lot of time on with with NASA over the last several years yeah because when you land something Apollo sized it was creating kind of broad shallow craters on the surface but when you land something starship size those engines are a lot bigger and you can rapidly transition into something called deep cratering. You actually right. make enough atmosphere around your vehicle that you start to get a uh, collimation of your, of your rocket plume and you get those shock diamond effects like you, like you see on Zodiac here. Um, if you have a small propulsion system on the moon, it just, it's a vacuum nozzle. It just goes out to infinity. And so it has a very different surface scouring effect, but right. when it's collimated, it can actually dig a crater to the depth of your rocket plume in three to four tenths of a second. No kidding. So it, it happens, happens like that. We've got some, some videos of, of it here. You know, the ejecta can be going out at 3000 meters per second. And it just, it's like hitting your, uh, hitting your vehicle with a, with a shotgun. Cause it erodes straight down, does a turnaround and then it all shoots up straight back into your vehicle. Yep. So, so let me let me because we're also going to talk about that in more detail because you have a solution for that whole problem as well. <laughs> I'm like, oh, should I show that? No, we're going to talk about that in a second. Um, I, that's what I let me hop back here real quick. But the camera here, this was the exocam that was another experimental payload that was on the vehicle, and it looks like the vehicle was hovering and then just sort of tossed this little camera bouncy ball off the side, right? Whee! <laughs> There it goes. <laughs> Literally, it's just springs there, and the springs, something released it, and the springs went thump and just kicked it away. But because of that, it the, the little camera ball landed before the rocket did, so the camera could watch the rocket land. Correct. Yeah, and there should be some video of that, I would think, in some of these. But yeah, it's, it's a pretty cool video, and it, it worked perfectly. It worked great. <laughs> so is that more to study... Like what you're talking about, the the plume interaction with the landing surface uh, and like the cratering and all that, or is that more like the exocam can provide data to the vehicle for where it wants to land or or uh, or placement in that way? Like, what's the what's the utility there? Both, all of it. It's great PR too. I mean, we're all <laughs> we're all photo people, right? Who wouldn't yeah. want to yeah. have an external view of a, yeah. a lunar lander coming down? Um, that's yeah. a really good point. I didn't even think of that, but I probably should have. That's a very good point. But sensors on it, it can it can help with all sorts of stuff. So yep. yeah, very very adaptable and capability driven technology. Yeah, and it doesn't just have to be a video. You could have other parts of the payload that are measuring the the amount of regolith that slaps against the side of a little position where the camera is, or captures particles, or whatever. Like you can, you don't yeah. just have to send video back. You've deployed a sensor to the surface in advance of your arrival, like just before your arrival, but then you can get more information about what happens when you arrive because you've tossed that little, it doesn't use a rocket engine, so it's not going to have its own effects. It's just going to sort of bounce off the ground and roll away, hopefully not too far away. Correct, yeah. And there's, you know, read, read into that payload a little bit more. It's it's a really cool story. You know, the guy who invented it yeah. also did a bunch of stuff on, you know, Mars 2020 and really a non-traditional entry and approach into sending stuff to other other planets. It's a really cool story. Yeah. And I've got a, just for the sense of scale again, I've got a picture of the team with that specific test payload. And they've got the little test, the camera bouncy balls. Well, nobody would get mad if I called it a camera bouncy ball, right? They're holding them down there. So that's how large that specific test was for the uh, exocam. And again, you had your vertical takeoff, vertical landing test bed that can hover and fly and all that sort of stuff. And then they could slap, a, I say slap a payload. Clearly there's a lot more involved than that. But bolt a payload onto the side of the open architecture and then do these tests um, to yeah. learn about how it works. That is cool. Yeah, and that's some pretty interesting capability too, right? You don't usually shed things off of your rocket in flight because it can change your 
vehicle dynamics and response. And so being able to, to handle that all on the fly is a, is a pretty interesting capability. You must not play very much Kerbal. <laughs> I do. Well, I do play a lot of Kerbal. But, uh, but you build your rockets correctly. They're not shedding things off the side of the rocket mid-flight, huh? <laughs> I mean, I, it's not unintentionally. A, not, there, there you go. <laughs> yeah. Oh, check, check your staging, folks. Check your staging. Check your staging. <laughs> um, but yeah, I mean, I do often wonder what, how different history might be if we had more small, deployable little inspection payloads like, like this. I mean, heck, I'm going to do it so we don't all get fired here. Uh, shuttle. What if shuttle had a little drone that could come out of the cargo bay and sort of inspect the tiles and whatever? I mean, this sort of you say it's it's a you know it's a useful thing, and I can immediately think of like ten different things. Like, oh yeah, if we can deploy a camera to look at the surface we're landing on, or the vehicle itself in flight, or what have you, it's it, it makes perfect sense as a, as some technology that you would want to pursue. Yep. <laughs> Most definitely. We've seen uh, China do that because they have the selfie stick and then they have the yep. little drone. It's the third party. And they're very cool images. It's things that we haven't done a lot of and uh, enabling more technologies like that for the surface of the moon. Like imagine that you see an Artemis landing, but the cameras are already there waiting for it. I don't know if that's... Is that weird that, oh yeah, we landed the cameras first and then we saw everybody else touch down. Like, uh, I think that's, that's the way yeah, to I mean, go for sure. Yeah, I mean, look at how much uh, playtime that Apollo, you know, 17 launch off the surface video get, yep. got, you know, and, and how, how many tries it took them to get that right. So, yep. yeah, th there's like, there's some whole entire story about the guy that was controlling that external camera, like getting it just right on that one launch. And it's the final, the final liftoff from the moon. And, and yeah, that footage, that's one of those iconic pieces of, of, you know, space flight ephemera is, is that footage of the top of the lamb popping off and the camera tracks it somehow. And you see all the debris flying. I mean, that's, yeah, that sort of yeah. imagery is, is invaluable. There's something to be said for uh, non renders, right. For storytelling and yeah. Getting yeah, absolutely. public engagement and interest. Absolutely. I mean, that's how you do it, right? That is how you get the public public excited is you show them the cool thing. Don't just talk about the cool thing. Don't just show a render of the cool thing. Do the cool thing and then show us it happening, please. I'm like I think practically screaming at other companies here. <laughs> <laughs> or, or let us show the cool thing. Like, come on, we have all sorts of things we can do. Just let somebody inside the fence to show the cool thing. Um, let me see. I've actually, I got that Apollo 17 video really quickly just to show, but this is very, what, this is 60 years ago, right? And this is yeah. a camera that was deployed on the surface of the moon and then actually tracked, this isn't like a wacky crop or anything, the final liftoff from the moon, like you said, Jack. And more things like this, it's one more of the gaps in our space history, right? We went to the moon and we didn't go back for the longest time. We had a third party or a third person view of a spacecraft taking off. And then how much more have we done that on other planets? Like it's it's another one of our gaps, I guess, in the history. Um, did we well, miss look at that Mars helicopter. I mean, yeah. look at what that's been able to, to do, so. Yep. I can't believe that's still flying. It's like, oh, maybe it'll fly two or three times. And now it's like, I don't know, 50 kilometers, no big deal. Like, we'll just keep flying, whatever. Um, Such an awesome little vehicle. <laughs> yeah, it really is. Um, did I miss anything else with Zodiac there? I mean, we talked about Exocam. We talked about the like the scoop payload. We talked about what it was, uh, the test bed itself. Did I miss any cool projects there you want to hit? i just say, you know, reach out if you want to fly something. We, we love working with people, and we can help get you funding to fly on the vehicle. So... Very you know, cool. We're, we're doing some stuff with Purdue later this year, for example. So even even student college level can can fly payloads with us. No kidding. Awesome. That's really cool. Yeah. Let me see if we've got any uh, questions here relevant to that, and then we're going to keep going on because we have that's like two of seven topics we were going to talk about, and we're halfway through the show. Here's um, more of a statement rather than a question, but uh, Shana Mullen is saying that Exocam is the same company that has a microphone on Perseverance. Yeah. So that ah. is that is cool. Yeah, he's he's an audio engineer and, and composer and musician, not a traditional background. Like he pitched that to NASA. I think there was a Wired article about it. Very worth looking up. Very cool story. Very cool. All right. Um, Jack, I was looking through the... Uh... <laughs> Somebody said you could name one Zoolander. I see. I saw. <laughs> when you're running out of names, yeah. it's just yeah, Zoolander. When you're scraping I mean, the bottom of the barrel. I like it though. I kind of like it. Uh, yeah, I I will not comment on that. <laughs> just smile and nod, Matt. Just smile and nod. Yeah, back to the mug. Uh, let's see. 
I, it's the no comment mug. Like every now and then, you just pick up the mug and take a sip, and that's my my uh, cue to move on. I um, love it. I don't see any other big questions on that, so we should. Jack, did did you have any? I don't think so. I mean, we went over a lot of different things with Zodiac. Um, so right now, you guys are going to continue to fly Zodiac while you get Zogdor online, or they're going to both fly concurrently, or uh, or how does that going to play out? Yeah, they'll they'll continue to fly concurrently. Very cool. Yeah. And and Jack, you've just uh, brought up the new the next topic of conversation there. Excellent. <laughs> so, Matt, tell us a little bit about this vehicle whose name has an X in it, Zogdor. The Zogdor, Burninator. Yeah. The Burninator. I'm sorry, I have. I feel like it. I have to sing. Doo -doo 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 -doo. Anyways, <laughs> I'm gonna get a copyright strike because I'm too good at singing the song. <laughs> the Launchinator. Sorry, yeah. Matt, go ahead. <laughs> Zogdor is kind of the, the evolution and, and next steps. It's kind of bridging bridging between what Mastin was trying to do uh, under the XS1 program with DARPA and kind of evolving the Zodiac line of vehicles, more capability, higher speeds, higher altitudes, and uh, the ability to take larger payloads and get more performance uh, for the customers. So can do some pretty, um, I would say them but call them sporty sporty things you know when you're getting a, getting a rocket up there and hovering and twisting and translating for for these payloads so they get the the views and the angles and the speeds they need to test out their their software and hardware so it's going to be some some pretty great flights to watch yeah so the the yeah. rendering here that i've brought up that actually shows the vehicle above the clouds with a pointy nose, a little bit more finished yes. than the open test frame, right? Um, it looks like it's got grid fins of some sort up near the top. So this seems like it's designed to go higher, faster, farther, is what you're saying. Exactly. Higher, faster, farther, you know, supersonic, quite a bit, quite a bit higher. And this is a this is an older configuration. I'm sure we'll be releasing a, a new version in the in the coming months as as you get into the math and the analyses, things kind of evolve and, and iterate and change. And Mastin's really big about that. So let's continue to, to push towards those customer-driven capabilities in, in the design. Very cool. You said it, it came out of the DARPA uh, XS1 program. Uh, that was like a, like a space plane program or something, right? That was a reusable launch vehicle capable of uh, five launches and or 10 launches in 10 days it was it was the goal for kind of small sats you know, I think 1200 1200 kilograms to Leo if I'm remembering correctly but that that program we did phase 1a and phase 1b with DARPA and didn't pick, get picked up for phase two unfortunately but a lot of that knowledge that we picked up about designing large vehicles that was also a lox methane vehicle and uh, has kind of made its way into zogdor so that it becomes a merging it's, it's the space between an xs1 and a, and a zodiac got it very cool ah uh, man i love this imagery i mean desert plus rocket i'm a happy guy <laughs> yeah one one change you'll see on on, on the future version as we, we switch to a single engine design. So you'll see one plume instead of multiple. Very cool. Single engine. All right. Yeah. yeah. And I did, that's what I was just looking over here um, through my, my list of renderings and I was seeing if there were any different configurations, but there are some configuration changes, like you said, and those renderings are not released yet. So we'll just have to uh, stand by and wait to see what other changes they're going to be. I mean, I see landing legs, I see grid fins, I see, a, like, we see three plumes here. You said there'll be one plume. Um, any other hinting at some changes or... Uh, not, not beyond that. <laughs> okay. <laughs> we'll, we'll see where the, the engineering and the math leads us. Gotcha. It's um, going to be fire engine red. No, I'll, I'm sorry. I'll stop. I'll stop. Racing words, stripes. Scotty, you know, we, we cannot fight the laws of physics, so we have to uh, work with them. Yep. Darn it. Stupid laws of physics. <laughs> the, rocket, the rocket equation is unforgiving, right? Right. But this one is not going all the way to orbit yet. That's what you were talking about. This is like a high altitude, high speed test vehicle, but it's not going all the way into orbit, right? 
Correct. It's not designed to be a, a small launch vehicle. It's designed to be a more capable test bed. Gotcha. Is it, uh, does it have capabilities and, you know, you got the mug handy. Um, so I've only got three renderings to show. So does it have capabilities? Like, could it take off from, say, Mojave and maybe end up somewhere else? <laughs> <laughs> Love it. <laughs> Love it. Okay, so so not quite going all the way to orbit, but uh, it is a higher altitude, higher velocity test vehicle to uh, get customer payloads going faster, higher than than the previous test beds, right? Yep, faster, higher, more control. Do things you can't do in an airplane or a helicopter. Okay, all right. How are we looking here? Are we looking like we're still doing math on it? We want to be flying it in the 2022, 2023, 2024. Do you have any statements, any information on that? We're already ordering hardware. Already so. ordering art- hardware. Nice. All right. Um, did I miss anything about this one? Again, I'm just going from topic to topic to topic. So, it's it's a cool one, but you know, stay tuned as we get further along in the in the program, and we actually have hardware to show. We will, you know, be able to show what we've done instead of talk about what we want to do. So, in typical Maston fashion. Can't wait. Cannot wait. All right. So let's see here. Next in our list, and again, I'm just going down the list. We have no script. We have, like, bullet points with, with links, but we don't have, like, okay, now we're going to talk about topic three. It's it's just, all right. Next on the list, you had talked about problems landing places, right? I'm, ex- I'm excited about this. I'm one. super excited about this, too. Um, you're going out to the moon, and you know that the moon has dust and regolith, and the, and the dust is actually super sharp. There's no weather to make it soft. It cut the astronaut spacesuits when we were out there for Apollo, and so flying regolith and holes that you blow in the ground with your rocket engines can be important and can cause problems for your mission. Um, how are you going to solve that besides <laughs> relying on a landing pad that's already there? Yeah, so that's that's the chicken and the egg problem, right? Do you want to send a hundred plus million dollar mission there with a robot to try to build yourself a landing pad? Because that's going to cost hundred, hundred fifty million dollars. Yep, and take quite a bit of time. And then you have to know exactly where you're going to be landing, so you can't divert, you can't change your mind, you can't go somewhere that looks more interesting. Um, you're kind of locked in. So. That was the current approach. And then this all came about working on these plume surface interaction problems with, with NASA doing some fundamental research as part of the SBIR program, looking at how do you try to better understand and model these, these cratering events. It's incredibly complicated physics. Uh, if you're familiar with XKCD, he did a, a New York Times article in, in Comet, comic uh, talking about how the model, the physics of modeling sand that's blowing around is harder than quantum mechanics, um, just because of the sheer number of interactions between particles you have. Yeah. And so if you have a trillion particles and they're all bouncing off each other, just the amount of computational power it takes to, to model that is really, it's impractical. You can't, can't do it. So you try to figure out shortcuts. And one of the things we were doing for NASA was doing tests with real rocket engines to try to understand what's going on so we can we can develop those shortcuts. From that, we started seeing effects and getting ideas. Well, how do we, now that we're getting to understand the problem better, how do we mitigate it? And from that's where the FAST landing pad program came from. And FAST stands for in-flight alumina spray technique. That's a classic backronym. <laughs> classic backronym, <laughs> nice. We need, we need a landing pad, FAST. Yes. <laughs> So it's designed to be deployed from the lander on on final descent using the engines. So you can deploy it between uh, 30 and 50 meters above the lunar surface, and it it creates a hard landing surface to to keep to keep your engines from digging craters and, and kicking up dust. So this kind of solves that chicken and the egg problem and, and eliminates a, a precursor precursor mission and. If you look at some of Phil Metzger's work, he was, a, he was a partner on this program. He did some modeling for Artemis showing that these larger lunar landers, they can actually kick dust up into lunar orbit and cross gateways, cross gateways orbit. So yep. you're, you're suddenly not only impacting things around your landing site, but you're also impacting things in lunar orbit. 
you don't want to be taking out satellites like LRO that makes some people angry. You don't want to be taking out other countries' assets yep. that make people really angry. And long term, you want to be able to land vehicles next to each other. You know, currently they're using exclusion zones around the, you know, the Apollo landing sites. Um, but in the future, it would be particularly on the places at the South Pole where maybe there's resources, maybe there's great solar conditions, and you want to start clustering vehicles in those areas. You want them to be able to land right next to each other without shredding everything else in the area. Yeah, so, that makes perfect sense. Or if there's like a, some sort of lunar hab on the surface, you know, you don't want to shred, you certainly don't want to shred that. So spray paint your landing pad as you land using rocket plumes. Like it's, it's so like, on the one hand, it's wild. It's absolutely wild technology. But on the other hand, it's like a no brainer. It just seems so obvious. Like, and, and something you would see in a, in a movie or, a, you know, a sci-fi TV show or reading a book, it's like, yeah, the rocket engine makes its own landing pad by spraying aluminum all over the surface in a <laughs> controlled way. Like, that's amazing. It's some pretty cool physics. It's based on some some Earth-based spray technologies that I used in an earlier job making uh, aircraft engines. But, you know, they're, they're doing grams per minute deposition rate and from several centimeters distance. And here we've transitioned it into kilograms per second because you need to get about 180 kilograms deployed in about 10 seconds and then you need to do it from you know 30 to 50 meters so it's a completely different regime of of problem and you're also doing it on an unprepared surface so you get some really interesting particle interactions with the surface as you try to to build this up because you each little particle is like a micrometeoroid hitting and so you get secondary cratering effects and particles bouncing off each other it's it's pretty wild i i i I have to explain to make sure everybody understands what we're talking about here, right? So we're talking about you're going out to the moon and it's dusty and you don't know exactly what the terrain is and you land and dust is blowing everywhere and your rocket engine may be so big that it digs a hole and then you fall in and then it falls over and you find yourself in another situation where you have to rescue Jeb, right? Yeah. So, so normally this is a problem that you have to solve. In what Matt is talking about with this fast system, it's literally injecting material into the plume of the vehicle while it lands in that via that that material gets fired out of the rocket engine it's carried along with the plume really and it goes down and it impacts the surface and it cools there and it creates a landing pad underneath the vehicle as it's landing and that's nuts yeah if you want to look at uh if you look at those the plume surface interaction files we we sent you look at plume test six. That might be a good demonstration of what some of these plume effects can be like when you do not mitigate them. Let's see here. Plume test six. I've got a couple examples. Let me see if I can find that one real quick, but talk a little bit more about that while I see if I can find that specific one. One question I had is, is fast flying on Zeline? Is that going to be something that, that uh, you guys test with that lander? I wish, but no, it's, uh, it's still in, in development. So it was part of the NASA NIAC program, which is uh, NASA Innovative Advanced Concepts. So it's really kind of their experimental, experimental, super future ideas program. So it, it has quite a bit of development yet to do. We've we've tested some material samples, but that was just material samples. They were not deployed from the from the fast uh, kind of rocket engine. Um, but so the material looks good. The math all closes, but now we need to start building it and testing it and iterating. Very cool. Send it to the moon. So, and I guess what you were talking about earlier with a lander that's sort of the size of Xylene, it's the that plume impingement on the surface isn't quite as you know it's not a, a big problem. You're going to get sort of a, a broad, shallow crater versus a, lo- a much larger vehicle is when it actually sort of becomes a problem. Correct. It's yeah, it'll be much less of a problem on the clip scale landers, particularly because we have multiple engines as well, so that spreads out the load across the surface so you'll get a much more apollo-esque you know cratering that makes sense i've, I've got that plume test six video but it is a uh, buffering or something like that for me it's not actually yeah, it's, a, it's a large file yeah give it just a second here and i imagine that uh that will play in a second i found it it was in the plume interactions because there's all these folders and it's like fast zogdor xylene and it was under the plume interactions folder not under the fast landing system folder 
<laughs> yeah, we did send John quite a bit of stuff. So yeah. Hopefully, hopefully you had fun reading it. What a problem to have, right? <laughs> hey, I'd rather have a lot of information than too little information, that's for sure. Yep, yep. And and it really just it speaks to everything that you guys are doing. And there's are there's I'm looking at the list. There's a bunch more in the list too that we're gonna hit here. Um but fast is just so cool and it's something we've talked about quite a bit um in you know in the course of our other streams and, and whatnot. It's it's really fascinating technology. Um you said what was it? You said 180 kilograms. Was that the was that the number that you said? Is that like sized for a specific size of a vehicle? Is that that's how much you would need for an X size vehicle, or is that sort of like a broad number where if you put down that much, you probably have enough uh, c- coverage for most anything? Yeah, that that one was sized for a kind of Blue Moon esque national team style lander for Artemis. If you uh, for Starship, you're going to want something a uh, you know a little little bigger, a little thicker. That's quite a quite a quite a lot more mass. And, Makes and sense. The Raptor engines are impressive. Quite. Uh, and I, 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 while you're waiting for that to buffer, Doss, I, I might be skipping ahead a little bit here, but you guys have the a, a rocket mining system. So not only are you figuring out ways to avoid having the rocket plume interact with the surface and damage things in a negative way you're also looking into how do we use the rocket plume productively <laughs> and use it to actually mine from the surface which we'll get we'll get to that it's, it's coming up it's coming up yeah stay then tuned we, then we have uh, night yeah. and we have perry and we have we have lots of other topics too <laughs> I, I think the saying is if you have a rocket engine you need to shoot everything with it or if you have a hammer everything's a nail yeah no that's <laughs> that's a that's exactly the, the yes that makes perfect sense when you have a hammer everything's a nail when you have yeah. a rocket engine everything is Needs to have a rocket engine pointed at it, I guess. <laughs> yeah, it, I love again, it. It's one of those things we found out as we started looking into some of the fundamental science about how these cre- craters form. It turns out that it's incredibly efficient to dig holes with, with rocket engines. They are highly energetic, and they move stuff out of the way uh, very, very quickly. So you don't have to do you know, centimeters per hour, you can do meters per second. And you can, instead of getting, you know, a couple hundred kilograms of, of water per, per year on the on the moon, you can get tens of thousands of tons. Um, like, I think we are getting 200 to 400,000 kilograms of ice this, this single system could do in a, in a year. The amount of material it could use and, and move is is just staggering, and in the uh, what's the what's the phrasing? All this has happened before. All this will happen again. There you go. Thinking I had a good idea that no one else had thought of once I started researching it. Turns out the uh, the Russians tried this in the sixties and seventies, <laughs> and they were drilling, you know, meters per minute through granite with this technology wow. uh, i think vodka was involved um <laughs> as a fuel or <laughs> i'm kidding sorry both maybe I don't, both I don't maybe know. but you know that's it's it works it's really impressive and so if we can if we can harness it on the on the lunar surface i think we can change the game for for lunar resources because suddenly you're not going to be water constrained you have a swimming pool on your lunar base and um yeah. you know Fill up, fill up those starships on the way to Mars. Let's let's jump forward to that because we've been talking about uh, the other thing. I mean, this was this was the next project here. Did this one have a? Oh, it's just a rocket mining system. Okay, I was like, do I know the acronym for this one? Um, no, no, no X with this one yet. I'm but, disappointed. Uh, Come yet. on, <laughs> yet. yet. <laughs> nice. Um, so for this, you were literally talking about using the rocket engine not to create the landing pad, which was fast, but using the rocket engine to dig holes in the ground and melt ice and then extract water from that melted ground and storing that off. Because once you have water, then you have hydrogen, and oxygen, yada, 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 right? Um, but this seems like a totally wacky idea because here's how it works from your video. And it's literally a rocket pointed at the ground. Well, the, I got teased there at the beginning of the video with the <laughs> drilling animation. And then we went to this. Um, let's see if I can find the drilling animation again. We're talking about landing. Okay, there's a lander. That lander looks familiar. Yeah. <laughs> and there's it a rope. underneath it. There you go. 
Nice. There's a rover that's coming down off the top of it, and then in the rover, you have mounted a downwards-facing rocket engine, which is another very Kerbal thing to do, I would say. Yes, but, and shout out to uh, you know Lunar Outpost for providing this rover with us on this project. No nice. kidding. So the fully loaded rover weighs 1,100 kilograms, and it can travel 3.45 kilometers per hour. Show me the rocket engine. Yes, graphs. So there's like a, there's like a dome inside yeah, yeah. the chassis of the rover, and in the top there you go. You can see, and there's a dome, and there's a, a rocket engine inside the dome, and then it sort of blasts out the surface. This is it's, just it's got a skirt that goes right? down. It looks like. Yep, it was a, it was an interesting problem solving the the skirt to create a repeatable kind of pseudo dynamic seal with the unprepared lunar surface. But uh, we think we've got a good design there to keep it from blowing out blowing out the side. So we we dig it all up and then you can either melt it all and catch it on a condenser plate, or you can keep it frozen and uh, and sort it out using a, a system called Aquafactorum from Phil Metzger. Okay. So that's, it's... What's, that's what this is showing. It's a sorting sorting methodology. So you can pull all the ice, ice out and keep it frozen. So no kidding. So you're literally the rocket engine on the bottom of the rover digs a hole. The fact that it digs a hole, a bad thing when you're landing, a good thing if you want to dig a hole intentionally, and it sort of blows mm -hmm. the regolith and, and the material around inside the dome, which sort of captures it, and then there's a vacuum cleaner that vacuums it up, and then it gets sorted out here into usable components, I guess, is the right way you could say it. Yeah, yeah, it's basically a, a pressure-fed system because we have the, the rocket dome on one side creating pressure, and then we leave the outside, you know, the, the exit open to space, and it, it's just a pressure differential, so it blows itself down and, and sorts along the way. It, it says two pneumatic cyclones to clean and upgrade the ice. I can't say that I've ever heard the terminology upgrade <laughs> my ice. So change it from, you know, like a mixture of 8% by mass relative to the bulk regolith, you know, down to, we just want to keep the ice so you can, you can upgrade it to like a hundred percent. It's, it's not like you go to the store. Ice. It's not like you go to like a fancy bar or something and you get the ice. That's a perfect sphere versus just the normal ice cube stuff. That seems like a, upgraded ice to me, but you get the ice nine that can freeze all of the water on the planet. Uh, yeah, <laughs> exactly. Exactly. Or they are the ice that sinks instead of, uh, instead of floats. There you go. <laughs> Yeah, and so we did some we did some testing in Mojave on actual frozen frozen regolith. So we froze it all with uh, liquid nitrogen at you know eight percent mass concentration, and then turns out rocket engines dig through that no problem. So no kidding. And I guess it's creating thrust underneath the rover, but the rover is heavy enough that the rover is not going to like take off or anything, right? Yeah, that was definitely a, a big driving part of the design and we keep the rocket engine pulses pretty short to yep. give the system time to blow down because yeah you're otherwise you're going to take off and you don't really want to do that very Kerbal I, I feel like it's <laughs> it's like the the plot of a sci-fi movie it's like I don't know let's hijack the, the mining rover and we'll take off and use it as an emergency escape craft or something instead of a mine anyways <laughs> it's very Martian the Martian very much so yeah I love yeah. it it looks like it's going back home to transfer. It had some little tubes that went out, and apparently we've refueled this, and it's taking off again. Yeah, goes back to that reusability. No goal. kidding. So, and because you're you're digging this much water and ice, you can turn this thing fully self sufficient, so it can it can run off a you know a fuel cell and solar panels and make its own rocket propellant. So it, it bootstraps itself from the surface. You don't have to send it with very much, and then it feeds itself along the way so literally so again, yeah get, go ahead you were going to say it i think yeah yeah i'm just trying to, to to minimize the amount of you know down mass you actually have to get to the moon because it's very expensive to launch it there so if you can take advantage of isru with your isru extraction method that's the goal yeah. the other big piece of this is you know both my parents are mining geologists so i grew up around a lot of this mining equipment it's big it's bulky it's heavy and it breaks all the time because it's really tough mining stuff here on earth it's going to be even tougher mining stuff on the moon so if we can replace all the excavation equipment with with a rocket plume that doesn't ever erode or degrade you, you suddenly remove most of your system maintenance so you make it much more reliable long term yeah i mean you're literally talking about a rover that refuels itself as it roves around the moon because it's digging for 
ice that it can turn into propellants that it can use to refuel itself. That's, yep. <laughs> it, it, I mean, we joke and we're like, oh my gosh, that's amazing. But those are the sorts of technologies that we need to have if we are going to not just go back to the moon and make some more boot prints, slap down a flag and call it a day. If we're going to go back there and actually have a prolonged presence, that's the type of technology that we will need to develop. Yeah. I hate to state the obvious there, but that's that's what it is. It's not just a one and done sort of thing. I just I, I think it's very cool, and the science is a goal of a lot of it. But at the end of the day, it comes down to to cost and how how affordably can you do these do these missions and turn it into a business and not just a go there once and then you know you're you don't go back for fifty plus years. Yep, yep. Um, I've got the four gigabyte video that we were waiting to see. <laughs> <laughs> Sweet. Um, now I've apparently got to put it on a different drive because I ran out of drive space on that drive. Um, but let me get that copied over here and we can actually see what we were talking about there with the plume test. But all of these things, like I'm, I'm getting, it seems like there's a theme, right? And when you come up with one idea, it's not just like, okay, we've done this one idea. Cool, we're done. It's like, okay, we're going to use this vacuum system to slap on the landing leg and then vacuum up a sample when we land. Oh, but then can we use the same sort of vacuum system on our mining rover to bring the stuff to one side? And then here's this sort of engine. that we, I mean, it seems like there's a common thread. You're not just doing one thing, but you're truly developing base technologies that can be leveraged across multiple different applications. Exactly. Exactly. Yeah. The, the vacuum, the Honeybee Robotics Planet Vac, Yep. that influenced the design of the rocket mining and they did it did, did a bunch of work with us there and they also did a bunch of work on the fast landing pad for the, the pneumatic movement we basically you know reverse the vacuum and so how do you how do you transfer all of you know 100 plus kilograms of particulate into your rocket engine which is not something people normally do yep. so <laughs> they were working with us on that problem as well like intentionally tossing FOD into the plume so that it becomes yes. a landing pad underneath you. That's not a normal thing, right? No, no, no. I think many rocket engineers would be uncomfortable with that. <laughs> be uncomfortable. So, we're gonna try. <laughs> so we've downloaded this. So by golly, we're going to watch plume test number six real quick here. Um, <laughs> I mean, see. the thing about plume test six is it's really choice. It's way better than plume test five. It I'm was. <laughs> I mean, you've got a rocket engine, you've pointed it at the ground, and you've lit it, right? What's going on yeah. here? Yeah, so this is, we were doing a bunch of different conditions um, in different regimes of, of plume cratering. So because we are on, in atmosphere, we can simulate lunar conditions or terrestrial conditions with different thrust levels and different heights to take advantage of some of the plume physics as it spreads out. So this one is more of a, a, a deep cratering, and you can see just how quickly it creates a crater and then spits all of that regolith back up at the rocket engine. I mean, when when we got this thing off the stand, it looked like it had been through a you know a pretty robust sandblast uh, sandblast coating. So yeah, you know the, the gratuitous slow mo is always good, but you can see you can envision how damaging this would be to a vehicle, and you know this this hurt them on that you know, Curiosity Mars rover, I think they broke a wind experiment from rocks that were kicked up during landing just, just like this. No so kidding. it's it's a real problem and it would feel terrible to send something all the way to Mars and then it, it breaks <laughs> on landing. So we don't want that to happen again in the future. Like, like look at this footage right here. I, I think a yeah. lot of people don't understand what happens. It's just, duh, 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 I'm going to go out and land on the moon. But, but look at the slow-mo footage. I'm just going to scroll it back real quick. The engine is, let's see, go forward. The engine is firing at the ground, and it's almost creating a reflector dish that just sends everything right back up at the vehicle. Look at all of the material going up like that. And yeah. you're going out to the room, out to the room, out to the moon, and you're trying to land. And when you're going down to land, you're digging a hole, and you're literally firing things back up at the underside of your rocket. I could see that causing serious damage to the rocket if you don't deal with it. In the bigger engine you have, or multiple engines you have, the more of a problem that may be. Yeah, and this happens so fast, tenths of a second. So we have another. We we iterated this test stand, and we actually have a moving one now, so it can it can replicate the vertical 
drops. Trans there you see it over there on the right. That's the vertical oh, translation. It so it actually drops and, and simulates a landing. So mm -hmm. you get the full, you know, you, you start your burn high. And it continues to burn as it gets closer to the surface, and then it shuts down when you land. Well, I didn't so mean you... to show this video. Um, <laughs> I accidentally went back to the other video. This is the Exocam video, but that this stand right here is what you're talking about, like right here. Correct. Yeah. That's how I was trying to draw I it. That it's... stand right there, huh? Yeah, I think it's the only one in the world right now. So it's a pretty interesting capability to have. No kidding. And you, you're going to mount. I mean, you mount an engine on this thing, and then the test stand actually lowers the engine down closer and closer to the surface, as if you were doing a landing. So you can see how the plume affects as you were simulating landing, like you said, right? Yep. Yep. It matches a landing velocity of about you know one and a half to two meters per second for an Artemis style landing, and so it's a much more realistic way to test landing pads and. That's what we built it for to test landing pads for NASA. No kidding. That's fascinating. And for the for the viewers real quick, I don't know if anybody remembered this, but remember the the Starship renderings came out and we're all like, how are they going to land Starship on the moon? These big massive engines, they're going to destroy it while it tries to land. And then the renderings came out and everybody's like, what are those? Are those lights? What are those up on the top? And we guessed <laughs> that they were thrusters because the thrusters were way up near the top and you keep them further away from the surface so you're not blasting yourself with Raptor shotgun effect coming back up at the bottom of the thing. Um, that's why we guessed that those high-mounted thrusters might, or those high-mounted illustrations might be thrusters landing Starship on the moon. Might have been informed by some work that y'all did. Possibly. Possibly. So the, again, it's, the physics is all the same. Yep. So tends to down-select for that. <laughs> I mean, I think you really said it best yourself. It's like a shotgun blast that you could be creating up into your engine compartment, which is just not good for the health of engines or a vehicle itself so yeah. it's it's yeah. absolutely fascinating to see you guys working to to mitigate that sort of thing and i, I just love how much of everything that you guys do is it, it feels like a no-brainer and it just it, like it gives me like a warm i hate to say it a warm fuzzy feeling inside it's like okay whew, someone's working on someone's it thinking because, about this yeah because if we want the future that we all want and we want a uh, you know a lunar hab or we want boots on mars or boots on the moon for a sustained presence and not just a pr thing this is the sort of technology that is going to have to be investigated and developed and the sort of problems that will have to be solved yeah and we're one company working on you know our small corners of, of all of this development and this you know cascades through every single subsystem has things like this you know we're a very propulsion and gnc centric company but every, every single subsystem has people working on all these really detailed problems that are incredibly complex. And, you know, there's a reason it took 400,000 people to get Apollo to the moon. And when all said and done with Artemis, it'll probably be, you know, similar scale of, of everybody working on all of these small problems. And at the end of the day, they'll all have to come together and they'll all have to work for us to get to the moon safely. Yeah. Absolutely. We remember when I said like we were gonna run out of time because we had so much cool stuff to talk about. We're supposed to have six minutes left here, <laughs> and so what I wanted to do is a deep dive on this deep regolith cratering and plume effects on modeling on lunar landing sites. And it's a twenty-page. Pa I'm kidding. We're not going to talk about this. Um, <laughs> this was. This is another one of the assets that they sent that, that y'all shared with us, Matt. Um, this was a presentation that you did. What I actually want to do. I was. I was kidding about this. I was just going to scroll through it really quickly because we could sit here and just do like an hour show on probably this page. Paper. but which would be cool would maybe be we cool. should in the future yeah i mean there's microgravity drop test footage and all that kind of fun stuff too so that that goes back to looking at the plumes and all these different regimes to understand the core core physics um, one thing i'd love to talk about for at least two minutes is our permiam technology that we've absolutely we've matured. it's i'm gonna bring that up go ahead pretty cool stuff so it it's taking some new approaches to additive to create engineered porosity in rocket engines for transpiration cooling. So what that means is very similar to sweating is you can, you can trickle small amounts of propellant through your metal surfaces and then they evaporate and, and keep them cool. And so this has been a, a program through the NASA SBIR program. And it's over the last couple of years, we've developed 
quite a few engines in multiple materials. So we've, we've applied it to copper, ink canal, and aluminum. So we can do aluminum engines, which really helps your thrust to weight on a, on a rocket. And it's, you know, we've scaled it all the way up to, to 7,000 pounds thrust and, and tested it at NASA Marshall Space Flight Center. There's, there's a picture of one of them there. And for that test, the combustion chamber was about 6,100, 6,200 degrees Fahrenheit. And we kept the surface of the injector at about 120 degrees Fahrenheit. And that was wow. a surface mounted thermocouple. So when you, when you start reducing your temperature gradients and your thermal stresses on your rocket engine, all of a sudden it's significantly more reusable because you don't get any of that thermal stress from all the, from all the cycling. And you can also move to materials like aluminum, which have much lower melting temperatures, but also much lower masses. So we've got about 800 seconds or more of, of testing on, on this material across the thrust range now. And um, this is going to be, you know, the new, the new engine for Zogdor. Awesome. So, so 3D printing or using that additive manufacturing allows you to sort of build in the, those transpiration holes, or if that's even the right term. Yeah, it's 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 like a foam because rocket engines are really interesting in that you need pressure drop for stability of your combustion. So you you don't just want to use some open holes necessarily because that really affects your mixing and that affects your combustion performance and that affects your overall efficiency and of your rocket engine and you don't want any sort of combustion instabilities to couple back with your feed system so to do that you you create a, a pressure drop across your injector face so you need something that's engineered and tuned to provide just the right amount of pressure drop that can also be strong enough to to work in this environment and so that was kind of the engineering challenge our, our partner on this was a company called elementum 3d so Gotcha. Absolutely beautiful imagery too of these uh, of this engine firing. Yeah, that was, is that's super cool. This I was just yeah. clicking through, like showing some of the, uh, I guess plume effects. We keep talking about plumes. This is a very plume heavy show. I guess we're doing today. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I just think it's wild that you can have, you know, metal in contact with the combustion chamber that that's that is that cold. So it really kind of changes the game for for some of these rocket engine development programs yeah was this in tim's why rocket engines don't melt did you it wasn't but it probably should have been i feel like it should have been like this seems like a good reason to, or a way to make rocket engines not melt we'll have to reach out to tim and say like hey dude you need to recut that whole video um yeah let's... and the, the really the other really cool thing about this is so you can you can tune it to actually damp combustion instabilities so you know if they had this during the f1 program they might have had an, an easier time and Again, they were they were working on that back in the '60s with a material called Rigimesh, but they didn't have the manufacturing capabilities to to actually go and tune it. But now we can. And the other thing is, it enables ultra deep throttling. So in a traditionally deep throttling engine, like this is why uh, the Falcon 9 has to do a hover slam because they can't throttle down low enough because they get these instabilities through their engine. Or if they want to design an injector that can throttle that low. Typically, it costs you quite a bit on the high end because you need to increase your pressure drop uh, on the high end so you have enough pressure drop on the low end uh, to, to keep yourself stable. The interesting thing we learned about Perm EAM is it enables a static pressure drop across the entire throttle range. No kidding. You, you could get a 20 to 1 or, you know, until you unchoke your throat throttle continuous throttle range and keep a continual 10% pressure drop across your injector, 15% pressure drop across your injector, whatever you want. But that lets you keep your stability across your entire thrust range. And that's really good for landing engines, yeah. which is you know, one of the things we, we tend to focus on here. No kidding. Really quickly. Um, I want to talk a little bit about the night system as well. Can we talk about the night system too? Yeah. <laughs> so yet another technology that y'all have been working on. Um, what do we mean when we talk about the night system? It seems like it has something to do with darkness. <laughs> yeah, it has something to do with the lunar night. And let me look up the... If I remember yeah, from my historical... 
my historical documentation, which I think is called uh, what Futurama, lunar night is very cold, and that is not good for humans or spacecraft, or it can be not good. I'm reading Correct. the website to try and figure out what it means. <laughs> it is incredibly cold. You know, it's, it says there, you know, negative 387 Fahrenheit. Um, nighttime integrated thermal and uh, electricity. So we have two programs ongoing with NASA right now. One's a SBIR, one's a tipping point. And we're, we're developing two versions of this system. It kind of functions like a, a little chemical hand warmer in that it, it uses reactions to create a thermal battery instead of relying on batteries and, and a, like a strip heater, which is kind of traditional state of the art right now. And right. Turns out it's much more efficient to do it chemically and get the heat because if you're if you want your systems to survive through the lunar night, most of what you end up spending resources on is just keeping everything warm enough that you can turn it back on again the next day. And so this enables you to to do that much more mass efficiently. And again, mass is money and enables you to get these long duration, 12 or more months, um, kind of more competitively and, and more economically than a, than a battery powered system. Yeah. Gotcha. So just to, to summarize really quickly, I mean, night on the moon is a long time because the moon is tightly locked to the Earth. When you look up, the moon always looks the same because the same side of the moon is always facing Earth, right? It's tightly locked. And so the moon only rotates like day and night about once a month, roughly, right? It's like 14 days is, is a lunar night. So it's not, okay, sun's up, charge the battery, sun's down, heat everything up with your resistive heater. Sun's up, charge the battery. So it's not. It's the sun's up for 14 days, no problem. The sun's down for 14 days. You got to tote enough batteries up there to the moon to keep yourself alive through that long night. And so how do you not do that? And apparently y'all have worked on something <laughs> slightly larger than a soda can. <laughs> I had to bring this up. Um, and like you said, it literally has a, a chemical reaction inside of it. Instead of consuming fuel, it's a chemical reaction that generates heat through oxidation, right? And Correct. if you've ever used one of those little hand warmers, like literally the little orange hand warmers that you open up and then shake around and then they warm up, it's the same sort of reaction. Y'all didn't just take hand warmers and dump them into a thing about the size of a soda can, did you? No, no, no. It's it's much more efficient and energetic. You wouldn't want to hold this in your hand. Uh, you know, it's it's not thermite level, but it's it's definitely not hand warmer. It generates level on your ski trip either. So generates some watts, huh? Um, yeah, it generates quite a bit of quite a bit of watts. And, yeah. yeah, it's about you know twelve times more efficient than a than a battery battery wow. powered heat. So hand warmers for the moon to keep your uh, electronics warm on the moon, right? <laughs> exactly. Exactly. And you know this. Any, any ways to do it, you know, economical and, and extend the mission duration, you get more more science, more data, Absol more value for your customers out of that. Yeah, absolutely. So I, did we miss anything big, Matt? <laughs> we talked about a lot of systems. We got the Perry AM. Um, we talked about the plume surface interactions, the night, the rocket mining system, all of sort of the go to the moon and stay technologies that uh, you were looking at. We talked about the fast landing pads. How do you deal with dust when you're trying to land? Your different test vehicles, both the historical and upcoming Zod Z Zogdor Zodiac, Xylene. It's like a tongue twister to just say your vehicle names. <laughs> um, did, I, did we miss anything over the course of an hour and a half here? I, I think we, we hit all the high points, and I think we could probably spend another couple hours talking about it all. So. Could or should? There you go. <laughs> future episode. Um, did you? I mean, you said Mastin is a sort of a propulsion centric company, at least at least initially. Did you want to uh, run through your um, your like the, all the engine development slide that we have here, or I don't know if we have time for that. Do we have time for? Yeah, yeah we can we can do that quick. This this hasn't been seen anywhere else. So you get a there you a go NASA space flight exclusive so far. So this just Love kind it. of points as to you know the the two huge pillars to, to make reusable spacecraft and, and the pockets possible are, are GNC and, and propulsion. And so this is our propulsion family family tree kind of showing over the last 17 plus years how it's it's developed and matured through time. And all of this innovation snowballs off each other. So you keep building and you increase capabilities and you come up with the next idea and Im improve performance. And so it's been a great, great journey going, going, you know, through time, starting with the 
you know, the hatchet engine for Zombie and, and Zoe that morphed into Scimitar, still locks IPA, but then they started experimenting with different materials outside of copper. And that led into the Katana and the Broadsword engine, which the Broadsword is a metal matrix composite additive manufactured aluminum engine. So, you know, really pushing state of the art and in, in thrust to weight that was through the DARPA XS1 program and then a NASA tipping point. And all along the way, we've been developing smaller test engines. Um, late last year, we had our first vacuum test of, of one of our, our small thrusters. So that was a great first for the company. That's the uh, RCS20 there under lunar and in-space engines. And, you know, now with Permi AM, we're continuing to kind of push the bounds of oxygen methane propulsion and, and performance. So. We build a lot of engines, we test a lot of engines, and um, I think we've done a good job of pushing the state of the art, I love particularly this. for our size. Yeah, absolutely. I love this slide because the, there's no shortage of mock diamonds on this thing. I mean, every single <laughs> image, it's like, you want mock diamonds? We got mock diamonds here. We got mock diamonds there. Uh, but, you're, but it shows. It shows that you guys really do a lot of work with engines, and you've built a lot of engines and thus have gained a lot of knowledge from from that process yeah we even have e-pumps we didn't we didn't talk about that today but that was kind of developed for the artemis program and you know we even got a little plastic rocket engine which i would love to get into some university rocket teams okay. so God, that I one's guess. you know pushing the boundaries of what you can do for kind of engines less than a hundred dollars and design and fab times of less than a day so wow you did say wow. plastic rocket engine right I did. I did. That was a kind of technology pathfinder to see how cheap we could make a rocket engine. Uh, and that was a chamber. Turns out you can do it for about you know, 80 to a hundred dollars. No kidding. Wow. <laughs> Matt, I, I cannot say thank you enough for spending time with us here today. Like it, it seems like this is almost a little bit of a tease. Like I'd love to sit down and talk about each one of these things for an hour and a half. And this was like the syllabus, like here's all the things Mastin's working on. Um, but we could, we could clearly talk more about all of these different things. Um, I think that the important thing here, I'm going to go back to the slide really quickly. Um, the important thing here is Mastin isn't a company that like started last year and got some funding because they had some PowerPoint presentations and then, oh, maybe by 2025, we're going to do this. Um, Y'all have been around and you've been doing things. You're building on actual experience, ground truth, literally in some cases, because you're taking off and landing on the ground. Um, it's, it's a thing that y'all have been working on developing technologies for quite some time now. And it's really exciting. It looks like this is going to be useful in helping us move out into space. Uh, that's, that's the hope. We want to make this affordable and go to stay. You know, we want to be, we're an infrastructure and, and transportation company. So we want to be helping people get where they need to go when they need to go there and yeah, stay, come back. Refuel in space, build in space. Yeah. Um, I'm going to do this really quickly, y'all. Uh, there's a ton of information on the Mastin website. Like we said earlier, you can go to Mastin.Aero, and I'm going to put that link into chat because I would encourage people to go and click around. There's links to the YouTube channels there as well. There's all sorts yeah, of videos on the, the YouTube channel. The go YouTube ahead. channel is amazing. Like, just go yeah. check out the YouTube channel uh, after this if you feel like it. And there's just there's no shortage of super cool videos of all these tests. So. Yep. I'm yeah. just going to go ahead. If, if you want us back, John, to talk about anything in, in more detail, just let us know. Absolutely. We didn't even get to everything. There's other stuff like we have a, uh, another NIAC proposal in for a solar powered Neptune mission, for example. Wow. Ah, oh, geez, I guess. So, go ahead. Building hundred meter solar arrays in. in yeah. Orbit, that okay. That was, that was my question is solar all the way out at Neptune. How big are we? Oh my gosh. Yep. <laughs> And also, Matt, earlier you said y'all are actually hiring um, information yeah. on the website. There's careers right up there in the upper right-hand corner of the website. And uh, if you are an aspiring rocket science, you're getting out of college or something like that, you're looking for a, a move laterally, something like that, um, go check out the website. The Mastin website has information on how you may be able to join the team and be involved with all of the cool technologies they're working on. Yeah, and uh, I'll definitely push our, our internship program as well. I think we have one of the best internship programs in in the space industry, our, our interns spend a lot of time hands-on with the vehicles. They're out there doing the flight ops. If you want to fly rockets, 
this is this is the place to be. No kidding. Um, I do know y'all that we did not ask a ton of viewer questions there. Um, but I think what we're going to have to do is is save that for the future. We're already 10 minutes over. We've already kept Matt 10 minutes over what I promised. Um, and he joined 30 minutes before we even started so we could do all the tech checks and get everything all set and everything. Um, but there's so many good questions that have been coming through. Um, I think for now we are going to have to go ahead and let you go here, Matt. I cannot say thank you enough for spending time here with us. And like I said, this is like the table of contents for all the cool things that Mastin is working on. It really is cool. Yeah, it's pretty pretty crazy. So what a great time to be in space. All right. Absolutely. Thanks so much, Matt. Yep. Thank you, John. Thank you, Jack. Great to talk with you today. See you outside of the, the launch sites. And um, yeah, let's do it again sometime. All right. Yeah. Sounds good. Y'all, like I said, go to Mastin.Arrow. Check out more cool things that they're doing there. Definitely check out the YouTube channel there. Um, lots of content above and beyond what we were able to show here in the time during the show. But again, Matthew Coons, thank you so much for joining us today. Um, it was just a fantastic time getting a scratching the surface, literally scratching the surface. I guess we could use the fast system to keep us from scratching the surface, whatever. Or we, um, could, or we could mine the surface. We could we mine, could mine the, surface. the surface. Yeah. We could really <laughs> scratch the surface intentionally with a rocket engine um, of all the different things that y'all are working on. But thank you again so much for the time. Yeah, thank you. Have, awesome. a, have a great day, and thanks to everyone who uh, you know watched on the weekend. I yep. appreciate it. Will do. Also today, folks, we had Mr. Jack Beyer on the other side of the Brady Bunch set up here. Um, Jack, you've seen him on lots of our shows. Jack, thank you so much for doing, tuning in today. Tuning in today. Yeah, I didn't. I didn't want to miss this one. This is uh, like I said. I, I absolutely love Mastin. They're like near and dear to me, uh, as, as near and dear as they can be to a random outsider. But for real, I, I think uh, I think this hour and a half or hour and forty five minutes almost now, our audience should have a really good introduction with Mastin and understand on a deeper level what it is that Mastin is doing, why that is so cool. And I cannot wait uh, to have you back, Matt, and, uh, and talk about some more of this stuff in more detail, but we'll, we'll let you go. And I'm just, I'm thrilled. I'm thrilled uh, with being able to talk to you today. And so thank you so much for sharing your, your breadth and depth of knowledge. Yeah. Yeah. Thank you so much. Absolutely. Love it all. Good deal, folks. And you know me, I'm Das, um, John Galloway for NASA Space Flight here. We're going to go ahead and sign off for now. Things are still going. Remember, we have our 24-7 20, streams as well. If you're watching what's happening over at Starbase or the port, um, you don't have to go home. You could technically stay here, but the video is going to stop, and it would just start looping, and that would just, I mean, you can watch as many times as you want. But uh, we are going to go ahead and end this week's NSF Live. Be looking, us, looking for us in the future. We do these every Sunday where we have a discussion about what's going on, a special guest a lot of the times. But but for now, we'll be signing off, and we will see you nerds later. Thanks so much for watching today. Thank you. Let's see if we can play this audio twice.